We're on to the epics again, and it's about time some Germanic was thrown into the mix. Welcome, my Mere Model Ads, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Karen, and I do these book reviews for those who want to transcend beyond their own mere mortality to get the juicy info from the book so that maybe you don't have to read it yourself, or maybe it inspires you to go find and read a book. And today, we've got an inspirational book for some people, at least. It is Beowulf by Unknown. We don't actually know who the author is. That being said, this book itself was uh, translated by Seamus Heaney, And this was published in 1999, although the original poem was created, constructed somewhere around the 1000 AD mark. It's a pretty shortish poem. This translation itself only got to 100 pages or so. Uh, and that includes a little bit of an intro by the author and the uh, by the author by the translator as well, um, and it was written in Old English and set in Scandinavia. So it actually takes place mostly between Denmark and Sweden, where Beowulf has his adventures. Uh, There's three battles in particular for those who don't know about Beowulf. There's two whilst he's a young man and sort of up and coming. And then one when he's much later established after a sort of like 50 year gap, I believe. I'll talk a little bit about the the actual story. So if you want to skip this because you don't want the spoilers, jump on to the, the next section. But it essentially starts with the Beowulf. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem. The, a king in Sweden, I believe his name was Hrothka, although I'm <laughs> definitely mispronouncing that wrong. And he's have, he has this problem because this monster is coming into one of his halls called Grendel and basically killing everyone. And Grendel is, is plaguing uh, his town, his, his halls, and um, no one can kill it. It's too strong. Uh, and this is where our adventurous Beowulf comes from over the over the seas. He travels to, um, I can't remember if he's traveling to Denmark or to Sweden from one of the others. Uh, but he arrives essentially and says, I got this, mate. I'm going to kill this monster for you. And he does. He, uh, he kills Grendel. Grendel's mother comes up later. He kills her as well. He goes back to his hometown, becomes a king for many a year and then eventually a dragon pops up in his own land which he has to defeat before uh, unfortunately dying right at the end in his last heroic act so there's a that's the essential story of the the mythology behind it once again it's a it's relatively short um so it's not an epic lord of the rings type saga but you do get um a couple of stories mixed in with that so I'll talk a little bit about the history of the story before going on to the themes. And this was interesting because there was one surviving manuscript about this uh, about this poem, which was almost burnt in 1731 in a fire um, where a, a guy had sort of collected all of these old manuscripts. And like I said, it was written in this old English style. So it's very... Uh, I believe there's a little translation, uh, a, not a translation, I should say, a um, description of of what it looks like. So it's something like, something like that. It's a, it's totally, you can see in one word in particular, like God uh, shows up. You can sort of see, you know, Beowulf and names and sprang that might be more of like a jump type word and things like that. But a lot of it is incomprehensible. It's, even though it's old English, it's not readable English by modern definitions at all. It was probably written by one author. I believe that's the general consensus of uh, the the scientists uh, or the the scholars who read, who have dived into the, you know, the words and um, how individuals you can sort of tell through through data and an- analytics how individuals might have written where versus when it's a compilation of text and things like that so they think it was one author uh, and then this is quite widely translated um, if you haven't heard of beowulf before you you will after this so we'll go into the first theme and that is epics what divines the exalted few i mentioned right at the start that this was an epic poem and i've got a bit of a confession and then also a question and my confession is this book really didn't do anything for me these tales of Beowulf were I found not so great but I'll talk a little bit about that later on in my in my own personal observations and takeaway sections but it did get me thinking 
what is what defines an epic what is it that breaches the published consciousness so that i could say something like the odyssey the iliad the aeneid those are the the greek epics the gilgamesh the divine comedy by dante for example and then there's a whole bunch more related to you know the asian type ones and and specific areas of the world i'm sure there's plenty of of african ones which i don't know uh, i guess you could say that the dream time stories here in australia are, are like our version of the epics so there's certain stories which if not world are, uh, are known worldwide at least are known sort of countrywide as being you know this is our story in a way so why why do they pop up what's what's the reason that we only have a couple of them and what defines them so i guess there are there are other sources as well and this is where i'm thinking like why why this book in particular because for example there's plenty of uh, other tales and and poems that include king hrothgar for example who i was mentioning just before um but it's maybe because of this linkage in it because there's so many in particular characters which are linked out to separate ones uh whereas in this one there's there's a whole bunch of people but it's not like just one person it's not just beowulf it also includes the king it's not just the king it also includes you know his heritage and lineage and so i feel that there might be something related to almost like when you're uh, when you're trying to like promote a podcast for example it's good to link out to other people and then they can link back to you and then you sort of develop this ever expanding out web of of linkages whereas if you've got a singular focus or a singular character it might not breach that popularity level for everyone to be talking about like oh my best friend king hrothgar is in this tale you should definitely read check out this tale by unknown author you know a thousand years ago so that that could be one right there the linkage aspect uh, i think maybe this could be an academic's dream as well so this really appeals to the the scholars and academics because it seems to be rather contentious there are many many adaptations translations of of this work editions as well and so it seems to it seems to be contentious in some ways and when it's many people having a differing opinion on the same topic that's when you get debate and lots of people coming in and being like oh my god this this person said this but it's totally wrong and i think this etc cetera, etc cetera. another could be that uh, jr tolkien that he of lord of the rings fame was uh, wrote a book about the the beowulf and his thoughts on it and i i believe it was it was quite famous and sort of uh, interesting that maybe was it his work on beowulf that then lord of the rings pop, propped up later and that became more popular or even vice versa was lord of the rings being popular and then people saw that he had written about beowulf and so that also made it more popular and i'm not saying beowulf is just a recent phenomena of of being popular but it's it's one of those enduring legacies that it that's keeps cropping up almost it seems so it could be the academic's dream aspect and the academics talking about things push it onto the wider consciousness um and it could just be there's just enough reality versus fantasy so this does a, a it sort of appeals to all in a way so there's plenty of mythology you know it's got dragons it's got uh, monsters it's got sword fighting it's got people with supernatural abilities it's got a strong hero but then there's many aspects where people have gone on like a treasure hunt type thing and been like oh this aspect that was talked about in the book that actually exists this this area exists and so we can go find oh look that looks like a hall that was maybe once talked about uh, that could be king hrothgar's hall or something like that so you could get a mix between the people who live in the real world people who live in the fantasy world and it appeals to all of them And the final thought that I have was maybe it's just dumb luck. You know, maybe it was just a snowball effect. Someone picked it up. It's famous for being famous sort of like the Kardashians in a way, you know, why why are they super popular? Why uh did they become super famous? Well, it's because they're already famous in a way. It's sort of like chicken and the egg, which came first. And this could just be like that. Uh it could be a book, an epic just arose um 
you know, caught popularity at the time and there's no real rhyme nor reason for its popularity. It's just because. And and you can't pin it down to one certain thing and be like, it's because it was the best writing. It's because it had, you know, this amazing author. It's because it included this invention of a dragon for the first time or anything like that. Maybe it's just, who knows, you know. So those are some of the... The themes that uh, I, I got from this book were on thinking of epics. Now onto my observations and takeaways. One thing that you will notice in this is the crazy variance, and this is why it might be the academic stream. This probably has the most concentrated unique words per you know thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand words I've I've seen. It's almost like the translator or the author was saying. Yeah, I don't like the word good. I'm going to replace that with magnificent. Uh, I already used magnificent. I'm going to replace that with stunning or compelling or whatnot because there are just so many different words when reading this. It, it stood out to me at least as going, whoa, they, they barely are repeating any words here. Everything is unique, described in a particular way and it, it does give it this... Um, vibrancy in a way because you're you're reading it and it's like everything's different everything changes all the time now that being said I also found the book quite bland I didn't really get into it and so I was trying to think what what made it for me not stick out unlike the Iliad Odyssey Aeneid Dante's Divine Comedy all of which I've read and which stick in my mind a lot as being that at least enjoyable this one was sort of i was reading through it and just going uh it's okay you know it's not it's not my favorite and some of the the things was it it felt like there was no suspense it 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 seemed to me like he was always going to win even when they were saying you know oh this uh this grendel is so strong and no one's ever been able to pierce his hide or do anything it always just seemed like he was going to win. He seemed too powerful. You know, he he didn't even he voluntarily decided not to use a sword against Grendel because he went or a weapon because he went, "Nah, eh, I'd rather just rip his arm off." You know, I'd rather just fight a man to man against a, a monster. And you go, "Well, okay, that that does seem rather overpowered. <laughs> it does seem like he's probably going to win." Uh, and same with the the Grendel's mother and even the dragon. I believe he was lamenting because he was saying, oh, I need to use a sword for this maybe. I don't particularly want to. Um, so that there was that aspect. Um, there was also no gods or, or real defining characteristics, I guess you'd say, or like wacky things that pop up. You know, when you're watching or reading some of the the Greek ones, it's there's like a little bit of drama because Zeus is going and putting his dick into everything. Um, you know, there's there's the drama in between comrades and maybe like some personal drama or attention and whatnot. Whereas this was always just here's Beowulf, he's gonna go do his thing. Monster, Beowulf comes, kicks it ass. Oh, another monster comes up. Oh, we'll go out to it. I'll go kick his ass. You know that sort of thing. There was it was very. It was very one-sided and one, I, I would almost say one-dimensional. There was no conflict or, or tension that I personally felt in, in the book. Um, there was also just uh, quite a few random interludes, which just didn't do much for me. So they were talking about how uh, Beowulf got into a, a swimming contest once. He talked about how uh, he had to uh, battle someone. I think he might have had to retreat or he or he bested all these people. Then he was swimming with 30 armors on his back across the seas. And it was just these random little things chucked in, which sort of went, okay, um, that's nice. I, I don't particularly get it, but yeah, cool. <laughs> cool story, bro. Uh, so those were, I think, like a couple of contributing factors where I just the blandness uh, was there for me. And so nothing really stood out. So on to the, the summary. Overall, I'm slightly let down. I'd heard about Beowulf for a long time, never particularly got in the book, but I was you know, th- thinking, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I like epics. I like uh, random mythology stories. I like getting into these things. Maybe they'll, there'll be something really cool in here that I can get uh, into, but not so. So I'd, I'd heard so much over this and uh, I thought it would one, be longer and, and two, more absorbing in it. And it was neither of those two. 
So the only real theme it raised for me was why is this popular in the first place? And so I, I talked about that in the theme section, but I didn't particularly learn anything. I didn't, you know, understand more about uh, the culture per se, much like I did from Greeks where, you know, you can learn about Greek hospitality, you can learn about courage, or you can learn about how the psychological impact of thinking of a God and, you know, interacting with God sacrifices, what does it mean to sacrifice things? I found there was so many talking points I'd, I'd get from these other books or these other epics, whereas this one, just nothing, nothing came up for me. Um, and so that could just be me. Um, I'm just a, a mere mortal. So it's okay if uh, I, I don't particularly love the book and, and others do. So um, I'm, I'm glad it was short and I'm not discounting Norse mythology, the Scandinavian, the old Germanic myths at all. I just personally found this one not so great. So uh, if you have any recommendations for those, please let me know. So overall, I'm giving the book Beowulf uh, by the unknown poet, but in particular, this translation by Seamus or Seamus Heaney, a four out of 10. Yeah, yeah. And that is it for today, my mere model lads. Thank you for joining me to this part of the video, this part of the ending. What are your thoughts on Beowulf? Have you read it and found the same blandness that I have? Did you really enjoy the, the mythology behind it? Why do you think it is so widely known and regarded? I would love to know all of these things. Leave a comment below. I always get to them. And uh, if it's a really good one, I sometimes read it out in the book recap at the end of the month because uh, I enjoy uh, sharing your, your contributions as well. Uh, just a reminder that this is also in audio form. So if you are uh, more inclined for, for the audio version, or it's on all of the podcasting platforms, and would encourage you to go to one of the new podcast apps.com and use a boostergram. Those are ones that I, uh, messages that I read out in the uh, end of month recap, which I always do. Other than that, I really do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Kyron out.